had an idea. Um, although I'm known for fixing dog behavior and the behavior of dog owners, um, what I'm going to suggest is that we rip up the rule book um, and, um, well, use dog training techniques to retrain people. Um, okay, I, I know that doesn't sound entirely politically correct, but I've been doing this stuff for quite a while, and it really works. So I go all around the country um, fixing dog behavior problems. I've worked with about 4,000 dogs so far. The dog father motto is any dog, any age, any problem. So that means I'll take on any case. So I do see some quite severe cases. Uh, in fact, so severe that I found myself in a hospital operating theatre last year when I nearly lost um, the full use of that hand. To fix even extreme problems like that, I use some really simple psychological techniques that have been around for about 100 years, but they've been largely forgotten. Um, I use the same techniques in the National Health Service to help nurses and therapists um, to get better behaviour from the people around them. So you can use this on anyone. So if you'd like to get more of the behaviours that you'd like, less of the behaviours that you wouldn't like from people around you, perhaps sat next to you, then this is the talk for you. So let me tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I've not always been uh, a professional dog trainer. So uh, in fact, I never had a dog of my own until I was about 40. So for the previous two decades, I'd been running factories for a living. Um, I left university, 1980s, um, with a degree in Spanish. I went off to work for one of the UK's top food manufacturers, and, um, well, I spent 21 years there working my way up the corporate ladder. So by the time I jumped out, 2008, um, I had a team of about 200 people. So I'd learned how to, how to motivate people, mainly by trial and error. So what I learned was, eventually, dogs and people aren't that different. I got to the stage where I was going to be a management consultant. And then a chance conversation with a dog trainer changed my life. Um, dog training had become, become my Sunday morning hobby by then, you see. And this chap said, why don't you be a dog trainer instead? And I thought, because it's beneath me. But I said, why is that? And he said, because you're really good with people. I thought, oh, I wasn't expecting that. So uh, I said, what about dogs? He said, you're quite good with dogs. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> but he said, you're really, really good with people. And it's the dog owners, not the dogs, that you need to fix. Oh. So suitably flattered, uh, and I was hook, line, and sinker, I went off, and in the time it took me to drive home, uh, I decided that's what I was going to do with my life. So I went off to learn as much as I could about dog psychology, which was surely very different to human psychology. Or at least, that's what they were all telling me. So this word kept cropping up a lot, anthropomorphism. They love big words, right? What it means is attributing kind of human characteristics, such as thoughts and emotions, to dogs, yeah? So they'd have you believe that dogs are dogs and humans are humans, and never the twain shall meet. It's all completely different. Anything you've ever learned about parenting, or perhaps working with other people, that won't work with dogs. Well, don't you believe them? Because I've spent the last few years proving to myself that actually humans and dogs, we've got a lot in common. And there are a few significant differences too. So, well, yeah, they've got four legs for a start. <laughs> so, I decided I need to learn a bit more. Um, so I discovered a little bit of psychology that really controls how we all learn by trial and error. So this stuff works with everybody. You could try it with your work colleagues, your boss, the kids, your other half. You could try it on the dog. Works a treat. <laughs> it's called Thorndike's Law of Effect. So before you go rushing off to Google to check this out, let me give you a little bit of advice. Wait till you're having a sleepless night because it will send you to sleep. I'll give you an idea. I printed this from Google just this morning. Well, from Wikipedia, to be precise. It says, the law of effect was published by Edward Thorndike in 1905. So far, so good. That's English. It then says, 
It states that when a stimulus response association is established in instrumental conditioning between the instrumental response and the contextual stimuli that are present, the response is reinforced, and the stimulus response association holds the sole responsibility for the occurrence of that behavior. There you go. <laughs> Just do that stuff, and all your problems are solved. See you then. No, really. <laughs> It's a shame because if you put that into play in English, it's really easy to understand and to apply. So, shall we have a go at that? Three rules. Three rules you need to understand. Dead easy. Rule number one, any behavior that you reward will increase. Okay? So, if you encourage somebody, you'll get more of that behavior. No rocket science so far, yeah? Okay. Rule number two, this is the opposite. So, if you make a behavior uncomfortable, then you get less of that behavior. It decreases. Now, don't misunderstand me here. Uncomfortable is not an excuse for abusing and being nasty and bullying to people or dogs. Uncomfortable is just enough that your subject is saying, I didn't like that outcome. I'd rather do less in future. Yeah? And rule three is about attention-seeking. So, attention-seeking behaviors, they're the ones where any attention is good attention, right? So, if you ignore them completely, those behaviors fade away. But for today, I'd like to concentrate on rule one and rule two. So, make it feel good, get more of it. Make it feel bad, get less of it. So, where should we place the balance? Good or bad? Well, you remember that dog trainer who got me into this malarkey in the first place? He was a man of few words. And on this subject, he, um, he used to say, all bad is bad, and all good is bad. <laughs> what he meant by that was, all nicey-nicey, and no consequences for bad behavior, that's not going to work. Think of speed cameras. We might not want to admit it, but the truth is, they do modify our behavior. Because if purely positive worked, <laughs> We'd have police officers hiding behind bushes all around the country, armed with flowers and chocolates, <laughs> waiting for law-abiding motorists to come past, and they'd jump out. <laughs> they don't do that, do they? <laughs> but all negative doesn't work either. In fact, all negative is even worse. We've got words for feedback that's 100% negative. We call it nagging, or even bullying. And whatever you call it, that's no way to motivate people. And it's no way to motivate yourself. Because lots of people nag and bully themselves all the time to try and get themselves to behave better. Perhaps you do. So, which way should we focus? Or perhaps we need a bit of balance of both. Well, there's a, a kind of universal truth which is expressed in lots of different ways. But today we could say it like this. What you focus on, you get more of. Well, think about that. What you focus on, you get more of. So what do you want to focus on? Negative or positive? Makes sense, doesn't it? Well, you can use this to motivate yourself. Now, this is the bit where I get to talk about ballroom dancing. So um, if we've got anybody here who's not a fan of that TV program, you can look away now. Um, the thing is, about three years ago, just over, I, um, I started ballroom and Latin dancing, and uh, started to compete in the National League. So I got myself a partner, Lynn, who's great and more experienced than me, so she gave me a lot of feedback at the start, um, <laughs> which was kind of fair enough because my frame wasn't very good. So let me explain. The frame for a gentleman looks like this. It's also called the top line. So it doesn't matter what you do, your frame must never move. You must never drop your frame. So what happens is, you start off with all good intention. As you start to move, you've dropped your frame. Yeah? Now, here's the thing. Judges in national competitions, they're not completely stupid. Not completely. Um, if you're six foot two and you drop your frame, they're going to see that, the other side of a ballroom, and it ain't going to end well. So our first competition was in Merthyr Tydfil in Wales. And um, I heralded this as our international debut. <laughs> now, unfortunately, we didn't do very well. Um, in fact, we came last. <laughs> so uh, we came last in ballroom beginners, and we came last in Latin beginners. So, so Lynn hatched a plan. 
She said, what we're going to do is, when you're practicing around the room, uh, when you drop your frame, I'll shout frame, and then you can correct yourself. Fair enough. So she's making my naughty behavior uncomfortable. In effect, naughty boy. Right? So I'm dancing around the room, and every time I'm dancing, we're getting frame. Oh, thank you, Lynn. Yeah, yeah. Frame. Yeah, yeah. Frame. Yeah. Frame. Oh, for goodness sake. It kind of worked, but not very much. So she... Um, Changed the tack. Now, I don't think she'd been reading Thorndike's Law of Effect, but in effect, what she did was she flipped the focus. One day, we were dancing around, and she stopped us in the middle of a waltz, and she said, that was great. Oh, really? She said, yeah, yeah. You didn't drop your frame once. You went all the way around this hall, and you didn't drop your frame. Now, to me, that feels great. So, um, well done. Thank you. Good boy. <laughs> so she'd flipped my focus, you see. Instead of beating myself up for dropping the frame, I'd started to focus on patting myself on the back for keeping it up. And the thing is, if you can keep it up all the way around the hole once, well, it seems reasonable to aim to keep it up for twice or three times. So these days, I'm glad to report that um, I can keep up the frame now just about long enough for us to get invites to competitions like the United Kingdom National Close Championships. So we went back there, uh, we went there back in July, and uh, we came away with two rather large trophies. <laughs> Thank you very much. They didn't clap that much on the night. <laughs> we, uh, in Latin, we, we competed against 30 of the United Kingdom's very best couples in our category. And we won, uh, not once, but twice. So um, we come a long, long way from Merthyr Tidville. And that's the lineup of the seven top couples in the country. Um, what you focus on, you see, friends, even if it takes three years, you get more of. So, well, that's all very interesting, isn't it? But it probably doesn't apply to you. I mean, I'm guessing that most of you don't spend your Sundays waltzing round ballrooms, right? Um, so let's give, a, give you another example, because you can really apply this to all sorts of things. So you remember I was talking about the National Health Service. Um, I spoke at a conference where there were 200 delegates, and uh, I invited them to talk about, in pairs, something that really annoyed them, some bad behavior that somebody around them did. Uh, and off they went. Now, what I hadn't thought of was quite how much we like to moan. The sound was deafening. The enthusiasm had to be seen to be believed. I couldn't stop them. So when they eventually did quieten down, I got a bit of control back. I, um, I got a great example from one chap, and he said, I've got this manager who moans all the time. He never, never ever praises us. Okay. He said, how would you change that round then? I said, okay, well, that's fine. Well, the trick here is to flip the focus from negative to positive. So, you know when you said he never praises you? Never? He said, oh, well, yeah, all right. Or maybe he does, but very, very rare. Maybe like once or twice a month. But he moans all the time. Okay, well, listen, we can focus on moaning about him moaning, and I'm pretty sure that's going to get us nowhere. Or we can turn it around. Let's see if we can get you more of a behavior you'd like instead. So perhaps we wait until the next time he praises you, and then we make that feel rewarding to him. Because what you focus on, you get more of. And he said, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Which is fair enough. He said, what, well, praise him for praising us? How's that going to work? I said, I'll show you how that's going to work. He might have to wait two weeks, but how about this? So he finally and begrudgingly perhaps praises you, and you say, excuse me, can I say something? Um, you do comment a lot when we get things wrong all the time, which is maybe fair enough, but... Um, I just wanted to take the time to say thanks for praising us just now, because when you do, that makes a real difference. Thank you very much. Now, if you say that with good humor, you'll be amazed at the effect that has, because of behavior that's rewarded increases. That chap is bound to be thinking, I could do more of that. So, the thing is, sometimes you might have to be a bit crafty about how you apply these rules. But the basics, they work every time, and they are. Any behavior that you reward always increases. A behavior that you make uncomfortable 
or ignore decreases. But nagging will only get you so far. Be clear about the behaviors you want more of and the behaviors you want less of. And be careful where you place your focus. Because what you focus on, you absolutely, without fail, ultimately will get more of. You can make this stuff as complicated or as simple as you like. But take my advice, friends, and make it simple. So simple, in fact, that even a dog could understand it. Thank you. <laughs>